your socks and grab your jocks. We're live! There are some games you go back and play and end up thinking, wow, this was shit. How foolish I previously was. But not Bulletstorm. Bulletstorm is a 2011 first-person shooter made by People Can Fly, who also worked on the Gears of War games. Matter of fact, Gears 3 came out the same year. My thought is the team just got so depressed working in the bleak atmosphere of Gears and this was their outlet. So this game is a first-person Gears of War style, except with some fun and smiling. Listen, I loved Gears 2, but that game is somber and depressing. Bulletstorm is much more entertaining entertainment. It's stupid, so stupid, but it is fun. The entire game is built around this brilliant combat system and the skill shot system of grading your performance. It's contrived, it's arcadey, but wow is it pulled off well. Environmental kills have a particular emphasis and the world is dangerous to suit that. Not all is so good, there are some weird missteps every now and then, but the game itself is strong for me. It can make a great impression. I first got hyped for this game in its motherfucking Game Informer Reveal magazine. This game has basically been impressing me since its announcement. Let's see why. Warning, I'm quickly going to go through the entire campaign and come up with something to say for each part. Spoilers are to be expected. Time code to skip this part is in the description and also right here. General, I'm going to take you. Take every motherfucking last one of you with us. And a sudden plunge in the sullen swell. Ten fathoms deep. On the road to hell. This intro is so goddamn badass. How to be a space pirate 101. You also get the required heartfelt backstory. Meet all the friends. Don't mind that little girl, I'm sure she won't be important. Alright, so you survived the crash somehow and you and Rel venture out to find some power cells so that Doc can repair Ishii. Along the way you make yourself acquainted with the native peoples and your new gameplay mechanics, kicking and leashing. You kick with gravity boots I guess, which has the effect of suspending the target in the air. The leash is an energy beam that you use to force pull enemies, like a reverse kick. With these tools, you fuck it up. The only friend left is Sushi Dick, the worst choice as he is now super edgy. This is a surprisingly effective intro bit though, seeing both of the cool friends die due to your reckless behavior and having to deal with the emotional fallout from that is a thing that Grayson will have to learn to deal with throughout the story. You and Ishii get to grips with the combat system and move on down an elevator. Once down the elevator, Grayson remarks about the structures you find. They also find it weird that these psycho bandits were using normal weapons. These are all little bits of backstory hidden here and there and it's pretty intriguing. After fighting underground and then above ground again, you find the wheel. The first huge set piece in the game is realized as a horrible on-rail shooting sequence. Literally, it's on a train. It kinda just takes too long to get through. Ooh, the looming threatening rolling wheel, I'm fucking terrified. The second huge set piece comes right after the first. How weird. You jack a helicopter, drop a something on the fucker's neck, and she leaves you alone. Ishii is still edgy slash starting to turn into a terminator, so he's really getting to be an asshole. You get introduced to the city somewhat, and start finding all the various collectibles. The section in the club was pretty fun. Explains World War <laughs> you go on to find this absolute peach. You try to chase her down because Grayson is desperate for any type of lady flesh, but she gets away from him in time. The time has come. I'm not sure why something this cool was put in the beginning of the game, but here we are. You get control of a mecha dinosaur with laser beams for eyeballs. Do I need to say much more? Using the dinosaur is easy enough, and fuck it is memorable. Anybody that played this game will probably remember this section, and it's only about a 5 minute sequence. The rest of the chapter, hell, the rest of the game is overshadowed by the robot dinosaur. He has a large shadow. Rest in peace, champ. I named him Waggleton P. Tallylicker. But I never got the chance to tell him. He will be remembered. Oh, no. 
this is another combat heavy segment chasing after Trishka. Also, meeting new enemies. You get to hear some things that I did not want to hear Steve Blum say. You wanna make out? Just two gruff military hardened dudes sitting in an elevator, snuggling out their woes in a totally hetero way. Huh. You get the sniper though, and that is definitely a plus. Also, I wanted to mention the trend I've noticed of having sci-fi holographic plants. That's pretty cool. I'd buy one of those. Especially if you could change which plant is shown. Eh? Eh? You finally meet up with Trishka and learn that this game doesn't fuck around with women. Next is just getting to know her some while fucking up a dam and emphasizing just how stupid Grayson is. You see any way across? Yeah. I think I do. As long as you do it quiet. Okay, that was funny. This section is just some team bonding, where you find out that Trishka is still definitely as toxic and abrasive as everybody else in the game. Start meeting some plant life. Now the group is after General Serrano himself so they can get a ride out. Next is more or less just combat. The plants get progressively worse until Ishii gets eaten by a giant fuck off plant. The plant fight sucks. Again, far too long. I just don't like any aspect of the plant fight. You rescue Ishii and trudge on. Building fall. Things are getting worse. I hope there's something soft at the bottom of this! Hey, Ron. Hey, Billy. That hurt. This is the worst chapter. Let's move on. We got customers! Tell them about today's special, Bucky! Today's special is something like the Gears of War Lambents, but featuring the chef's special glowing weak spots and a less explosive mannerisms for your pleasure. Crash in the tram plus the introduction to burnouts. Burnout boss. Pretty much a cakewalk, really. Fighting the burnouts could be rather challenging, making you take full advantage of the skill shots to secure kills. Some burnouts may only have one weak point on their leg. That's cool. And really aggravating to deal with. In a good way. Alright, so Trishka has a fall, Ishii gets all edgy, you and him have a fight, then you tell Trishka about Serato being an asshole. As a bonus, that little girl that I said was unimportant in the flashback sequence turns out to be Trishka. So now, she is mad at Serato too. You two go into a sewer and it seems like you're gonna fight this guy, but then he just gets fucked up by some pipes. The whole sequence is weird. Fucking weird. The big motherfucker is back. Domo origato, Mr. Ripato. And a shitty turret sequence. I'm really just here to see how the story plays out. Holy shit, what the fuck? Your missions with Serrano are privileged with Serrano's knowledge of the backstory. You get to learn what exactly was wrong with this planet. This planet was built as a resort planet around a less than habitable star, which was unstable and thus resulted in gamma storms on the planet. In order to protect the tourists, a huge network of radiation filters was developed. These filters required personnel and made huge amounts of industrial waste though, so it was decided that the planet's prison population would run the show. They shut them up underground and let them run the city. And eventually, when the prisoners rioted for better treatment, they shut off the filters as part of their protest, which led to the fucked right up planet which we see today, as the population didn't have time to evacuate before getting fried with radiation. Oh yeah, uh, also gameplay happens. Serrano mission with elevator sequence. Things are getting less notable again. The green glow on everything looks nice, though. The stream! Highly radioactive! My eyes! The goggles do nothing! Serrano starts teasing Grayson, causing the character development to come into the forefront. Serrano then tricks you into arming a huge DNA bomb to destroy the whole planet and betrays you. But Trishka is back. Next is the scramble to get on board the general ship so they can escape the bomb. Bonus points for taking your sweet ass time anyways. Literally, you get an achievement. The ending. The game sort of ends, really. 
I mean it when I say this game kind of just peaks and winds down. The end is a sequel bait featuring the not dead Serrano talking about reviving the not dead Ishii for more adventures. Oh, also the big bomb goes off and murders the planet. I think they honestly thought they'd get a sequel out of this one. It was really just the weird directions that this game took that turns me off so much. But the story isn't that bad. The gameplay is good, and the graphics are good. So where did it go wrong? For me, it was mainly in dialogue writing and in characterization of the protagonists. Although the most fun part of this game is just interacting with the skillshot system, the story is a surprising standout for the experience as well, although you will not likely remember it long. You would probably remember the Robo Dino bit in the combat, but the ending is just not as memorable. Once you finish the game, you unlock the New Game Plus mode that lets you earn infinite ammo and carry all of the weapons. It was surprisingly fun to work to get the infinite ammo and all the weapons. So no complaints here. But no big praise either, you don't get a medal for New Game Plus. Echoes and Ultimate Echoes are segments of missions cut out and put on challenge timers to add more content. I wrote that before I tried them, and it turns out I was right. I'm bored, let's move on. Multiplayer is next, but I should mention something before I start. When playing multiplayer as a solo player, you are basically unable to completely finish a match through round 20. Eventually, you need to do team challenges in order to make the points to get to the next level. It's weird that they didn't just make single player challenges if you started the game solo. That's one of those weird missteps I mentioned. And it wasn't fixed in the re-released full clip edition either. This is paired with not having co-op in the campaign, even though you constantly have at least one NPC with you. Was co-op just cut? There was definitely some strange decisions made. Multiplayer itself though is a PvE horde style multiplayer, where the long term progression is in cosmetics. In the short term, you buy weapons and upgrades per match, with currency earned through the skillshot system, of course. It can be surprisingly fun, as it is just one of the best parts of the game put into the spotlight. Mindlessly flinging enemies into cactuses is just tons of fun. And the multiplayer maps are not that bad. There wasn't one that I ended up hating, but none I particularly liked either. The cosmetics are fine, lacking only maybe in variety, but that's to be expected. Changing the leash color is nice. In lieu of the time-slowing sniper, the multiplayer mode has a blood symphony meter that gives enemies when filled and activated. It's worth a lot of points, so why not, but it's pretty boring to use. Overall, the multiplayer is fine. It adds more content, and it's sort of fun to grind in. There is opportunity to play this game online still as well. It's just refused to die. I think because there's nothing else that puts such an emphasis on environmental kills. So I got into a match with three other random players, and I can report that it's even harder to get the team challenges with four motherfuckers trying to do it at once. Eventually, the host got frustrated and left. It was surreal to play a random match after so long though, and it's a testament to the apparent staying power of the game. I think the best way to grind multiplayer would be with two people though. Four ends up being a proper clusterfuck. The game has a style and look about it. The environments are very detailed, and it's fun to look around every now and then and just take in the world. Here's another strange thing they did though. They added a cinematic visuals button in the options menu. I don't know why this is here. I'm not convinced it makes it more cinematic. Here, what do you think? It's just a cheap filter, right? And this weird feature is also not considering the people who say the original game looked better than the full clip edition in general. What a shit show! And the backstory and world, as explained in the spoiler section, is interesting enough if you just take it for entertainment. This isn't science, but it's certainly fiction. The lore is really well contained, meaning it only presents you with info that it uses in some way. Why is multiplayer mode called Anarchy? It's a reference and means that the multiplayer mode takes place earlier in the timeline during Operation Anarchy. That sort of attention is fun to recognize. The weapons are all pretty cool looking and interesting. You got the Lancer with the Melt-A-Gun setting, the pistol with the rocket launcher, a bomb flail launcher that you choose if you want to shoot Ishii, a time slowing sniper rifle with remote control bullets plus explosive remote control bullets, a cannonball launcher thing that I didn't use much, and a drill thingy that I used even less. Last time. In the campaign, I always just use the PMC pistol and sniper. You can easily clear the entire game with weapons of your choice, although it tries its best to encourage you to use new stuff. If you choose not to indulge in the new weapons, you'll have more points for ammo for the good weapons, so yeah. The leash also has an alternate fire mode of its own, an area of effect slam that throws all the surrounding enemies in the air. Using this arsenal plus the skill shot system, there's a huge variety of ways to murder your enemies. There is also a janky ass hidden auto aim feature that especially fucks up the flail launcher and throwables. Although the game has these notable features, everything else can be considered pretty standard to average. 
As a shooter, it failed to learn the lessons that Doom would later benefit from. Bulletstorm insists on being partly a cover-based shooter, with regenerating health. It kills the pace of the gameplay, which eventually gets to a point where it can feel as quick as Doom. It is indicative of the missteps made with this game. Even in the core gameplay loop, which is pretty good, they failed to consider the pace and style of combat. Going into this review, I would have said that the characters all seemed cool, but I think I was just fooled by the really good voice acting. I was never taken out of the experience from the acting, although the writing and the dialogue got downright janky at some points. In fact, I'd like to emphasize this. The dialogue writing is terrible, but the voice acting almost saves it. Almost. Their level design is again, average, although it does reward some exploration and paying attention. But there is only one way forward. This isn't really that kind of game though, and I understand why they did it the way they did. I don't understand the weird relationship this game has with co-op multiplayer. Nor do I understand why it still runs like shit, with bugs and occasional crashing. I don't understand why the slide makes you gain tons of momentum. I don't understand why they added Duke Nukem as a playable character. I don't understand what I'm supposed to feel after the ending. I don't understand why there's never a scarcity of drop kits scattered around. I don't understand this game's strange relationships to boss fights and cover-based shooting. But regardless. In total, I think that Bulletstorm is something like a decent 4 or 5 out of 10. Totally average. Somewhat memorable and impressive, but only because I enjoy mindless indulgence in violence and somewhat witty humor. Otherwise, it's just your average shooter of its time. Something fun and engaging without taking itself too seriously. At least that's what I got from it. I was pretty sick of it by the time I was done, but it was fun to go back to. If the humor failed, I could see the review score really dropping off for somebody. The jokes are crass and inappropriate, so I could see why someone just not liked this game. They just wouldn't engage with it. But all of this begs the question, where is Bulletstorm 2? Well, people can fly own the property, but they have been... busy. Maybe they'll get around to it. Anyways, coming up I'm going to be reviewing more games that start with the letter B for some reason, so make sure to subscribe so you can watch out for those videos. Thanks for watching. He's my favorite robot pal! He she was okay, but he wasn't 50 feet tall! Pretty cool party, come and see! You can get a robot and come killing with me! <laughs> Would you please shut up?